So obviously I am a fan of world building. That's basically what my channel was built off of and I've continued to talk about it ever since I started this play this thing. And well, it's a huge part of fantasy and science fiction works, but it's also just a huge part of all sorts of works altogether. Like, you know, even if you're writing just like a romantic comedy or something, if it takes place in a fictional town or a real town or something, you have to get the audience familiar with what that place is like, what the setting is like, what the people there are like, what the culture is, you know. So world building is a really big deal in stories of all sorts, and, well, I am a huge fan of it. But it's very, very easy to mess it up. You know, much like going back in time and stepping on a butterfly, you screw up one detail, and then years later, nerds are wondering why you're able to have an army of 12 million men in a country that's only you can walk across in three days. Like, you know, you see stuff like that, especially in fantasy and science fiction works. And, well, I don't know. You, you saw the title of this video. I don't think I need to go too much more into detail in this intro section. Uh, this is going to be the top building, or the top 10 world building fuck-ups. I think I'm past the 60 second mark, so I can just say it now. Uh, and, yeah, this is just going to be details that I found in stories, whether it's, you know, alternate history or apocalyptic or fantasy or sci-fi or whatever, and it's just details that really, really wreck the world building. This isn't necessarily all taken from books that I hate, uh, although, granted, most of them are books I dislike. I think there's one on this list that I actually enjoyed. But, well, I do want to emphasize that bad world building doesn't instantly make a story bad. Now, it it's a bad thing, certainly, and it does detract from the story, but the more important stuff is still, you know, plot and characters and all that. So I, unless it uh, pulls from those, it's really not that big a deal. I am solely just talking about how it affects the world building in most of these cases, unless I otherwise specify. I'm going to be sticking to minor spoilers for all of these. Uh, there's, I think, one series in here that I give major spoilers for, but that one finished like 10 years ago, so I don't think anyone's going to be too upset with me for it. Uh, but, you know, hey, yeah, that, you know how a top 10 list works. Let's, let's go. So starting off at number 10, we have uh, The Fifth Sorceress, which is... Oh god, I hate that book so much. It just keeps coming back, and I'm probably gonna have to read the whole series one day, but in this one, it's just how Eutrasia has basically no government other than the king. Now, pretty early on in this book, uh, Eutrasia, the kingdom where the main characters are from, gets invaded by the evil sorceresses, and they kill the king, and they kill the directorate of wizards who were, like, his magical council, you know? And after that, the entire entire country just falls apart into chaos instantly. Now, the thing is, they do have a rampaging army going throughout uh, them, and a bunch of their leaders were just killed. So I totally, totally understand how that could cause breakdown in, in society, and that would cause some chaos and cause a lot of issues. I'm not saying that wouldn't be a problem, but it wouldn't instantly collapse everything right away, especially in like a medieval system or maybe post-medieval. I don't really remember the technology level all that well, and I do not care enough to check. There should be other governments. Like, there were specifically a couple of nobles that they mentioned did not come to uh, the big events where the king and everyone else was, so wouldn't they, in their own lands, if they were smart, be able to maintain control there at least, and possibly even attempt to take over after the bad guys leave? And even without them, wouldn't there be towns that have things like mayors and town councils and constables and sheriffs? You know, other people that have some sort of authority in those areas? Or, hell, even just religious uh, officials like bishops might also be in there? Or uh, non-governmental entities like guilds, which are, you know, maybe not super powerful in this world, but they at least have some authority and some uh, sway in the local area that they could do something, you know, and <laughs> it's just, it's just not there. Nothing of this is there, and it's a terrible book for a lot of reasons, but that one relatively small detail has just always stuck out to me, because it's very obviously coming from someone who just doesn't understand how governments work or how societies are structured, and yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say. It's just really dumb, and uh, if you are unaware no, a president dying, even in 
like a super centrally controlled dictatorship does not instantly equal the whole government falling to pieces. Like, it takes a lot more than that. All right. Numero Nueve comes from the testing, which uh, just a couple months ago I did a whole long video of that <clears throat> entire series, which is awful in a lot of ways, but uh, probably the biggest thing about that whole series that stood out to me is how the testing, which everything is built around, is specifically killing off all the smartest kids in the Commonwealth. Now, the testing, if you're unaware, is basically just one of those Hunger Games clones that came out around 10 years ago, you know. It, it's a dystopia, teenagers lead a rebellion, save the day. It's a particularly bad entry in that genre, but, you know, it is just an entry in that genre, so there's not a whole lot that's new there. Except that in this world, uh, the government every year takes all the smartest kids that graduate high school and brings them to the capital for an event that's just called the testing. Like, it's, it's a proper noun, so you know that's how it's being serious. And it comes in pretty quickly that students who don't do well at the testing die. Like, it, pretty early on in the first book, there's uh, one of the smaller tests they have to do where they just have to fix a broken radio and one kid screws up while doing it and a nail gets shot through his eye and he dies. Uh, what? And, th and then later they have a testing where they just, like, drop him in the wilderness and like, okay, you gotta go a couple hundred miles back to the capital and also you're gonna be shooting at each other and there's wild animals and stuff. Uh, good luck with that. And it's just, the whole time, I'm just wondering why they bother doing this. Like, there's not even a reason given. It's just, yep, the, the evil government does this sometimes. And, uh, well, it's really dumb. You know, it, I, I think that's the simplest way I can put it. But for starters, um, no one seems to realize that all the kids are being killed, even though after they leave their hometown, they never come back. And people tell them that, okay, they just got reassigned to different colonies on the other side of the country, but, like, no one suspects a thing here is extremely stupid to me. And then you also have the fact that you're literally killing off all the best and brightest in your country. You know, like, th these kids, they even say a bunch, like, you're the smartest kids in your classes, you're the future, okay? You're gonna grow up to be future doctors and scientists and engineers and mathematicians. You're gonna help us rebuild the world after it was destroyed in this apocalyptic war, and that's very true, but then you're killing off 80% of them. So you're actively shooting yourself in both feet by doing that. And then, that's not even counting how when you make the penalties for failure too high, people stop taking risks, and so by doing all this crazy stuff in the testing, all you're doing is uh, convincing these kids and the, you know, the ones who go on to like graduate and actually be in college and everything, you're convincing them to always play it safe, and that's... In some situations, yes, you should do that, but not all of them. And, like, like example, if you thought that, like, you had an optional test you could take in school, and there was a 20% chance that if you took the test, it would raise your grade and you'd get into a good college, but there was an 80% chance that if you didn't do well on the test, they would just kill you immediately, most people aren't going to do that. They're not going to take that risk because the rewards and the penalties for failure, the rewards for success and the penalties for failure are just way too far apart from one another. So it's just dumb on a lot of levels. And it's kind of disappointing because I think that this setup, if it was written by a smarter person, I think this setup could be used to actually comment on standardized testing, both in America and in other countries. Like, because... Yeah, it's set up in a dumb way, and it doesn't always help kids, and it doesn't always help society. And in fact, in places like Japan or Korea or Taiwan, sometimes these things get so intense that it kids will just straight up commit suicide over it. Like, the stress and the pressure is too much for them, and you could have said something about that here, but you didn't. Number eight. This one isn't from a specific book so much as an entire genre, but in every urban fantasy ever written, why does the magic world bother staying hidden? Now, I've mentioned this before, I'm mentioning it now, I will probably have to mention it in the future, but in many cases, the magical world could have taken over the human world. Like, in some cases, yeah, like with modern technology and everything, they wouldn't really be able to take over everything, and humans would probably wind up killing them all if they knew about them, so 
it kind of makes sense for them to stay hidden. This isn't every instance because sometimes like they can only be harmed by magic or something like that. So, you know, it still doesn't make sense. But I I'm not even talking about the modern world necessarily. I'm talking about how come 3,000 years ago when the war chariot was the pinnacle of military technology, how come back then all these spirits and fairies and gods and wizards and stuff didn't take over? You know, like, they, they could have done it back then. Like, humanity did not have the numbers, the technology, or the knowledge necessary to properly do that. Like, they could have ruled over the population as demigods, or, and they just never do. And I'm willing to overlook that in some cases. Like, a couple years ago I read a book called Doppelgangster, which is urban fantasy, and that one is meant to be a little more lighthearted, and also it's shown that the magic is not super, super powerful. Uh, so it, it kind of makes sense that the magical world would stay more hidden from uh, society at large. But still, I always have to wonder that, and now you always have to wonder that too. <sighs> Number seven is from the worst book ever written, The Way of the Shadow Wolves by Steven Seagal. And in this one, somehow over the course of seven years, 84,000 jihadis have been snuck into the United States through Mexico. Now, there's a lot of reasons this doesn't make sense. Uh, for starters, the Mexican border is not that easy to smuggle people across. Like, I'm not saying that things don't get smuggled across, like people and drugs, because they very much do, but it's not that easy that you could get 84,000 of them. And for another, all the jihadis coming across are Arabs and Pakistanis that are pretending to be Mexican by speaking Spanish. And I said in that review, just because you can't tell the difference doesn't mean they can't. <laughs> like, a, a lot of Mexican people would be saying, hey, I think Abdullah isn't from Mexico City. I, I think he's from somewhere else. And he keeps talking about jihad. Maybe we should do something about that. Like, someone would notice. And then you have an entire city's worth of people, which admittedly they are spread throughout the entire country, so it wouldn't be immediately noticeable to your average person, but to like law enforcement agencies and stuff, th that would be very easy to pick up on. Uh, because I think I mentioned this as well, like back at, during the Cold War, there was a spy ring of Soviet spies in the United Kingdom that was like a hundred people. And one of them got drunk and blabbed and then the police caught the whole spy ring. And that's the thing when you have large groups of people, it becomes easier and easier for there to be some sort of information leak or double agent. And when there's 84,000 of them, that definitely would have happened. Like, people would have noticed this shit, Steven. And then, to top it all off, like, these 84,000 were brought in to perform a variety of terrorist attacks, which happened in the, uh, the, I'm sorry, I got water on my sleeve and it's uncomfortable, I can't keep it in one spot for very long. Uh, these terrorists are brought in to perform a series of attacks at the climax of the book, all over the country, and you would only need like less than a hundred people to do all the attacks they mention. And the book only mentions like a couple dozen of them at most. So what are the other 83,900 of them doing this whole time? Like what, what, what's their point in all this? Like th this is just a good example of why just adding an extra couple of zeros onto a number are not, is not always a good thing when it comes to world building. Like just saying, okay, this country is bigger. Like the, doesn't necessarily uh, make anything better, you know? Like, you, you gotta think these things through a little bit. Like, I think maybe if this book had had, like, 84 jihadis, that would still be a pretty high number, and it would still work for the story we're telling, but I guess 84,000 because scary foreigners. And of course, number six <laughs> is actually pretty similar because this one was from True Allegiance, which was written by Ben Shapiro, and in this world, for some reason, after the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, it turns out Iraq really did have nuclear weapons. Like, I think in real life they did have some chemical weapons, which could be considered WMDs, but they did not have nukes. They just, they didn't, okay? Saddam Hussein's regime did not have the capability to do that, either uh, intellectually or materially. They just, they didn't. And if they did, then they would have brought definitely used one or two of those bombs on the invading forces like that's just what people do when you uh put them against a wall like that and yeah the 
Iraqi government to that point was like, okay, it would be either this or we all die, so let's give it a shot at least. Uh, in fact, that's basically a plot point in the first Modern Warfare game, now that I'm thinking about it. But in this world, not only did Saddam Hussein's regime have nuclear bombs, but they hid one of them in Iran. Here's the thing about that. Iran and Iraq hate each other for a variety of reasons, which I really don't think I'm qualified to go into, but just as an example of this, they fought a really nasty war against each other in the 1980s, the Iran-Iraq war. You should actually look into that because, who that thing was brutal for, <laughs> in a lot of ways. There's a lot of war crimes and shit going on there. But, and then there's like the whole animosity between Arabs and Persians, which is there. And then there's also some uh, Sunni-Shia conflicts going on. Like there, there's a lot of reasons they don't like each other. And even if for whatever reason Saddam Hussein did not use this one nuclear bomb that he apparently had on the invading Americans, which I'm actually kind of impressed that Shapiro didn't just give them like 50 nukes, like he stuck to one, which actually makes a little bit more sense. That's why this isn't higher on the list actually, because you know, even if Hussein somehow managed to make a bomb like that, getting all the materials for it is very difficult and he would probably only be able to make one or two. So that bit actually makes sense, but they wouldn't hide it in Iran because Iran wouldn't take it. Like, Iran isn't on their side. They don't want to go to war with the Americans at that point in time. And if they did hide it in Iran, because I guess all Muslims are secretly on the same side, which they're, they're not, Ben. They're just not. Uh, but if they did secretly hide it there, Iran would immediately announce, hey, we have nuclear capabilities now. And frankly, for that matter, Iraq would have done the same thing the instant they had it. Like, because guess what? That's how you prevent yourself from being invaded. Like, even if uh, another country has a much bigger, more powerful military, if they're afraid of nuclear retaliation, they're not going to be able to touch you. <laughs> like, that would have happened 10,000%, but I guess in this world, logic doesn't apply, and real-world politics don't apply, and real-world uh, religious and ethnic differences don't apply, and just, I don't know, I guess this is how Shapiro sees things. Number five is from the Southern Victory series, and in fact, it's the only entry on this list that I, I actually like overall. So this series is alternate history, and it is a very good entry in the very tired genre of what if the Confederate States of America won the American Civil War. And this one is better because it follows what happens afterwards for like 80 years, so basically up until the end of World War II. And basically the dumb part is how the Confederate States managed to industrialize and grow their population at the same speed, or in some cases even faster, than they did in real life despite being cut off from the United States and cut off from a lot of the rest of the world. Okay, you could probably write an entire thesis on why this is kind of dumb, but even those who don't know a whole lot about the American Civil War tend to know that the southern states, the southern slave rebelling, rebelling states, really only, or not only lost, but mostly lost because their economy was dog shit. You know, they did not have factories or railroads or regular roads or just, they weren't producing things the way uh, the other states were. Uh, they did produce a lot of cash crops like tobacco and cotton and sometimes coffee, I believe, but they did not make a whole lot else. You know, even just like regular crops that you have to eat, they didn't make all that much of that because, you know, that's not as profitable for slave owners. And if they had somehow managed to uh, pull away from the United States, if they had somehow won that war, th I wouldn't see anything changing, you know, because most of the industrial centers in slave-owning states were in states that uh, stayed loyal to the Union. You know, border states, if you're unfamiliar, there were a couple of slave-owning states that did not side with the rebellion. Uh, and they had industrial centers, which the South just lost when that happened. And so they would have had basically nothing to build off of to begin with. And then they also would, you know, have just been at, uh, at war, which is always costly and messy which is why in real life their economy was falling apart at the end of the war. And then they just, uh, well, I don't want to call them a dictatorship necessarily, uh, because, but at the same time, they weren't just run by white men. They were run by a relatively small circle of wealthy white men. So if you want to be 
nice you could call them like an oligarchy or an aristocratic republic, but the Confederate States, just by modern standards certainly, were really not a democratic country. They, it, it just wasn't. And the thing about dictatorships is that they tend to neglect things like infrastructure. You know, they'll build a road from the presidential palace to the airport, and that's about it. Like, everyone else is kind of just left on their own, specifically because they don't want people connecting too much. And while that does help prevent revolutions, it also shits all over your economy. You know, like, the ruling class of the CSA might have been able to keep themselves living in luxury by, you know, having all these massive slave plantations and selling off cash crops, and maybe they'd have some industry, but they just would not have that much. Like, there's no way that they would stop sucking on this golden tit in order to diversify their economy. Like, that, that just doesn't happen. And the CSA, both before, during, and after the American Civil War, did not attract nearly as much immigration as the northern states because, well, they didn't have nearly as much uh, opportunities for immigrants, you know? They didn't really have the factories that you could work on or these massive cities where you could, uh, well, a lot of times land yourself in a ghetto, but, you know, at least you're, you're making a living and you're probably better off than you were before. They just, they didn't have all these opportunities for them, so their population would not have grown from 9 million people in uh, 1961 to 30 million by the time World War I starts in 1914, because they specifically mention it's about 30 million then. And tripling your population in that amount of time is kinda difficult at the best of times, but when you really don't have that much immigration, and when you, uh, well, actually, there were nine million people, three and a half million of whom were slaves to begin with, so, you know, that throws a wrench in the works as well. Just like, everything about the CSA was contradictory and didn't make much sense, and it just would not have gotten to this level. Okay, I don't want to rant too much more. Number four is from Divergent, which came out a long time ago, so if anyone cares about spoilers, leave now. Um, everyone there only has one personality trait, and that's not how genetics work. Now, I don't want to go on about this too long because I've talked about it before, but basically in that series, it's after some sort of apocalypse, and society has been divided into five factions. You know, you got like the brave one, the smart one, the kind one, etc. And uh, apparently in that world, there's also some people called Divergents who have, well, basically they have more than one personality trait. You know, they're both brave and smart and kind and selfless and just all that, which is dumb on its surface. And even when reading the book the first time, I was like, this, this doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm, I was kind of willing to roll with it at first because the story was still engaging at the beginning, but it it was really dumb. And then in the third book, we learned that the reason for that is that humans were literally genetically modified to only have one personality trait apiece, and they're called genetically damaged people, which, um, yeah, not touching that. Uh, but then the genetically pure people are divergents who have more than one personality trait, and they also were trying to breed more divergents by putting all the genetically damaged people into like big wall-off cities, basically like giant ghettos when you think about it, and just letting them breed for a couple of generations and think and hoping they produce more genetically pure people, which... Okay, it's not that genetics don't play a role in your temperament and your personality and your intelligence and all that, because it, it does. Uh, we can argue about how much it does, but I don't think me or the person watching this is qualified to do so, so... We're just, <laughs> we're going to avoid that uh, whenever possible. But the thing is, uh, if someone has genetic traits which you view as undesirable and you want to, you know, eugenics them out of existence, uh, wouldn't you want to make the genetically pure people try and breed a lot more and then, like, sterilize or otherwise prevent the genetically damaged people from breeding? Like, you know, because you're trying to get rid of them. That's what eugenics basically is. Like, wouldn't you, like, sterilize them or just kill them and then put the genetically pure people through, like, breeding programs to make force them to make as many kids as possible? Like, I'm not saying this is right. I'm saying that if you're in that mindset of trying to do something like that, wouldn't you go all out with it? This is one of those world-building details that really damages the story and the setting. So, and the characters, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. So it's just... I don't know, even though I've forgotten a lot of uh, 
details about those books over the years. I still remember overall that I disliked them. But even though I've forgotten a lot of details, that one has always really stuck with me because it's just nonsensical on every level. Number three comes from Shadow of the Conqueror, and <laughs> this one is about how apparently everyone in this world is naturally good or evil, and you can apparently cast a spell which tells you which one they are with 100% accuracy. Now, this book was written by a uh, fellow YouTuber, Shadowversity, and back when I first reviewed it, I went a little easier on it than I maybe could have for a couple of reasons. One being I thought it was his first book, so I was like, eh, we'll just we'll just leave it alone. Uh, but it has turned out that apparently it was his 13th. He's written like 12 others which were unpublished, and now I'm just sitting here wondering, like, okay, if that was... How bad were the first 12? Because <laughs> this one... Because this one really has a lot of severe issues. And the other reason being that Shad is just kind of a cunt, so I, you know, I, I don't feel bad being mean to him anymore when I learned that he likes to call trans women pedophiles and he likes to hang out with open fascists like Sargon of Akkad and stuff, so like, eh, whatever. He, I can, I don't have to feel bad about being mean to him anymore. But yes, as I said, in Shadow of the Conqueror, apparently you can just tell if someone's naturally good or evil and there could be someone who's just a regular farmer and has spent his whole life not hurting anybody, not doing anything wrong, but if protagonist Kuhn comes across him and casts his spell and sees, oh, okay, he is naturally evil, so then I guess it's fine to just kill him. Like, that's a thing that happens here, but at the same time, there could be people who are just nasty pirates or dictators or something who have killed thousands or millions of people but they're naturally good, so they're worth redeeming. Like, that that doesn't make any sense. And it ruins the whole story because the whole point of this story is that the main character used to be a nasty dictator, and he's trying to make up for all the wrongs he did in his life. He's trying to redeem himself. So wouldn't he be naturally good or evil? That doesn't make any sense. The whole point of this is that even the worst people can be redeemed, and you're just shitting all over that theme. You're just shitting all over the story, shitting all over the character, shitting all over... Everything here is stupid. And the thing is, this whole book is filled with a lot of uh, attempts to push Shad's personal beliefs, which is annoying but not inherently bad, except when he makes everyone who disagrees with him literal pedophiles and murderers. But the thing is, if he's going to do that, it's going to make me think that this is what he actually believes. So. Where the hell is he getting this idea that people are just naturally good or evil and you have to punish or reward them accordingly, but also if they fall decide later in life to follow the correct ideology, then even if they were evil before, they can be good. Like, where, where is he getting this idea from? Oh. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Number two is from Blood Rose Rebellion, which is... One of the first reviews I ever did on this channel, and even the uh, world building analysis I did on it later, ha is reasonably popular. But, uh, okay, this one might take a little bit of explaining. So basically in this world, magic is real, but also the entire world and all of human history has gone exactly the same way it should, it did in real life, which is dumb for a lot of reasons. <laughs> like. It's uh, the mid-19th century, and like all the empires and countries are still exactly the same, which is kind of stupid. And quite frankly, I could have put that in this place. But I, I wanted to talk instead about the magic. Because in this world, only aristocrats have magic, right? Like, regular peasant people never get it. And partway through the first book, the main character realizes that it's because the magic circles in every country are controlling who gets magic. And the fact that no one noticed this earlier just blows my mind. Because first of all, wouldn't somebody notice that no peasants ever get magic? Like, w wouldn't they notice that? Or wouldn't they at least notice that, oh, okay, it's only in Europe that this happens. Like, in America's, or the Americas, everyone just can't have magic. You know, it pops up randomly in the population. And you, no one questions that either. Which also brings up the question of like, okay, how far does this control go? Because it's mentioned that Charlemagne 
uh, cast a spell on it like a thousand years before the story began, and that's what caused all this. But, like, does it only apply to Europe? Does it also apply to Africa and Asia? Are there people in Japan that are dependent on their magic circles to get their power? How does, how does that work? But also no one apparently noticed that only people that the magic circles like get access to magic, and only people that they really like get access to powerful magic. Like, no one ever noticed this? Ever? You could maybe argue that a regular person who's not educated about magic and just isn't in that world uh, would not uh, be aware of any of this, and that would make some sense. But the main character, Anna, I still remember her name because she's terrible. I hate her so much up until, like, the climax of the third book where she does some cool stuff. But she has been learning about this her whole life. She's been invested in uh, this world of aristocrats, and she's learned about how to use magic and stuff. And she is taken aback when this happens. Like, she goes, oh my goodness, what? Like, e even if they didn't specifically tell uh, everybody about it, which would kind of make sense because they don't want the secret getting out, e but even if they didn't tell them that, how, how would no one pick up on it? How would Anna not pick up on it? And it's not just her being an idiot. It's like everyone she works with, too. Ah, oh, God, Blood Rose Rebellion. That's just, that's a really terrible book series. I just want to complain about that for a minute. Go watch my world building analysis on it if you want more. But th this is, this one small thing is easily the biggest confusion that I've gotten while reading a fantasy series. Like, m maybe you could argue that it's not as big of an oversight or as big of a fuck up as other things, but just how confused it made me and how little sense it makes, I, I have to put it at number two on this list. And of course, number one on this list, the thing you've all obviously been waiting for this entire time, is from The Young World, which I feel bad shitting on it because I did enjoy the first book, but the second and third ones are utter, uh, just, they're terrible. But in The Young World, there is this virus that goes out and kills everybody except for teenagers, and they mention it's something about, like, their hormones, you know, during puberty, which beforehand you don't have enough so you die, and then you're safe for years and years, but then around the time you turn 18 and your hormone levels drop, you die from the virus and, like, all of humanity has collapsed and it's post-apocalypse, yada yada, all that stuff. And there's some pseudoscience there, but I'm willing to look past that for fun adventure stories, but in the second book we learned that only the Americas died and the rest of the world is carrying on as normal. Okay, 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 okay. So, uh, first of all, they, th the rest of the world knows that the Americas died. Like, they tell them a virus went and they tell them it killed everybody. They didn't tell them that there's still millions of people that are still alive, which, okay, that kind of makes sense. They don't want people trying to rescue them or anything. That, that's fine. That makes a bit of sense. But I think if the last few years have taught us anything, it's that you cannot quarantine something that spreads that easy. Uh, or at least governments are not willing to take the needed precautions to quarantine that. Because we, we don't know exactly how this virus spreads, but if it infected literally everybody, then it's very infectious. It must go through, like, the air or something, and just passing by somebody on the street, they'll, they'll be infected. And if they're not a teenager, then they'll, they'll die right away, and they'll infect other people, and all of that. And maybe... If this, if we knew right away, like, how serious this was, other governments all over the world would be like, okay, close off the borders to all of them, don't let them come here, don't let our people go there. And maybe, sure, but they would probably not know that right away, and it would only take one or two people hopping on a plane or a boat and going to another country and then like, oh, look at that, all of China's infected, all of the United Kingdom's infected, all of Egypt is infected, and it would just grow exponentially from there. That's... Like, that's always been the danger of pandemics and plagues. And as we've seen in the real world, governments really aren't willing to, you know, shut down shipping and trade and travel and all that because, you know, the economy. And not to discount that, that is a big deal. Like, you don't do that unless it's something serious, but we know they're not going to do it unless it's life or death, uh, pretty much for them personally. And if they didn't know that, like, from the instant this all happened, and they didn't believe that from the instant that this all started, then they would not have cut off the whole world. So, or they would not have cut off two entire continents. So, really, in this situation, the entire world should have been dead. 
except maybe for a couple of isolated islands, uh, which managed to stop anyone from coming in and giving them the virus, and maybe a couple of ships would be out, and they'd hear about it, and they'd say, okay, we're just gonna stay out here, not docking in any ports or anything, and they might be okay. And there might be a couple of uh, isolated, really, really isolated towns in, like, northern Siberia and Alaska and stuff, which just say, okay, uh, we're just gonna cut off all contact with the outside world, and no one comes in, no one comes out. And that should have been the situation for this book. And the fact that it wasn't is, um... Well, I hate to just keep calling things dumb over and over again. This is spectacularly stupid, and I think that the last couple of years have really only driven that home for a lot of people. But I think even if I had read this years ago when it first came out, like, even then I would have said that does not make any sense. Like, something that's that easy to spread, you just, you can't stop it completely. So, yeah, that that is the number one biggest world-building fuck-up that I have ever seen in my life. It ruins the world that it takes place in, it ruins the story because the later books it becomes more about stopping like a nuclear bomb from hitting them and stuff rather than trying to restore the world and save their tribe. And it ruins a lot of the characters for various reasons that I don't feel like going into. Uh, you can watch my top 10 worst endings video if you want more detail on that, but man, it, it really went from one good book to two really shitty ones. So, yeah, that, that's it, though. Those are my top ten world-building fuck-ups, and I am genuinely curious to see what everyone else's are. You know, what, what are some of the worst world-building fuck-ups you've ever seen? Not just in books, but in all sorts of other things. Like, just let me know. Comment below and all that. Bye. If you watched this far, thank you so much. By this point, most people have just uh, taken to the comments section to tell me to kill myself. I wouldn't be able to do videos like this without all my patrons, whose names you see here. And a special thanks to my $10 and up patrons, Apo Savalainen, Eris Targaryen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodes, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Echo, Great Grebo, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis Bennett, Marilyn Roxy, Matthew Bordreau, Michael Weingartner, Micaphone, Peep the Toad, Return of Cardamom, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Tom Beanie, and of course, Vevictus. All of you are just absolutely the best. If you want to get your name on here, consider becoming a patron. If you don't want to do that, you could always support the channel here on YouTube, or just like the video, comment, and subscribe to my channel. All those are great, and uh, that's all for my takes for today. Goodbye.